and we will be underway in just a moment. Round number two of action from Grand Prix Atlanta. Hashtag GP Atlanta at SCG Live all weekend long. And I know there's other arguments for best uncommon in the sense. I know a lot of people will say Rolling Thunder. Uh, I've heard Halmar Tidecaller mentioned as another possibility. A lot of people like that card. I think in the absence of Green's weakness, uh, Chijuru Warcaller would be a, another option as well. How dare you talk about but Green like that? For me, it's Grip of Desolation. That's my choice. It's hard to argue. That card's very powerful. And a lot of people feel pretty strongly about that card as well. A Mind Raker, a Myers Malice, Nakana Assassin, Silent Skimmer, Transgress the Mine, all hiding out here in Parker's deck. He'll start things off with a Swamp as we are underway here in round number two. It's Planes here from Jeremy Henry. A second Swamp here for Parker. He'll have the first spell of the game. I believe a Culling Drone is where he is. So Henry's deck here, a, a little bit disjointed. It's a red-white deck, definitely airs on the aggressive side, as you imagine a red-white deck would do. Best card in his pool here is a copy of Planar Outburst. Now, Planar Outburst is one of the best rares in the set, and the fact that you can cast it for the Awakened amount it makes it even more powerful in games that stretch out. But it's not exactly the most, uh, the cleanest rare to have in an otherwise fairly aggressive deck. Henry has one of my favorite cards in the format there in Fortified Rampart. Mm -hmm. Just an 06, nothing fancy about the wall, but my walls don't need to be fancy. They just need to be a wall. They do a nice job of blocking. Parker gonna come in again. Just, oh yeah. Just test the waters, you know? Well, you wanna find out where they're at. Yeah, love it. Mindraker, nothing to process, so just a 3-3. Three, three. That's a 2002 attack right there from Parker. That's just that's just going back and just test the waters. That's a 2015 attack for me. I, I don't, don't see it that much in 2015. I saw a lot more in 2002. Uh, just see what's up. Just uh, see what's going on. I'm happy to get in there and then get my creature shear dropped. Yeah. Whatever. Gideon's reproach. Yeah. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's some risk there, but if anything, it makes the bluff more believable. We have a gold card. We have a Munda ambush leader. Not quite Goblin Ringleader for allies, but it is still pretty good. It's three, also four, a haster. 3-4 three, haste for four is a pretty good deal, and yeah. anything else that comes along with it is just, just gravy. Assuming you like gravy. We're in Atlanta. Everyone likes gravy. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> gravy is pretty good. I think this good. is a gravy capital. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know if that's an official term, but <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean. Henry not going to attack with the haster. He'll just pass the turn back over to Parker. Parker with some mana difficulties here. You see three swamps and ally encampment. What you don't see are any islands. So he'll just have to pass the turn back. Henry will draw. Was able to find an ally to put on top with the ambush leader. Fifth land is the plains. Red white typically an ally's theme. Red white can also be more of a late game removal and awaken style deck. Henry in the middle of those two things. So he's got some work to do on his turn. A lot to think about here. He's playing against an opponent who's clearly having some mana difficulties. Here's Core Blade Whirl. That's going to come in, grant first strike. That'll also trigger the ambush leader. So again, look at the top couple. You can put an ally on top if you got one. The rest will go to the bottom. We'll see what's next. Looks like the 3 4 first striker is just going to come into the red zone. Parker will take that damage. Coast looks clear enough on the surface. Parker would need to have a, a spell in hand, and with him passing land drops, not casting anything. Pretty good bet the coast is clear. Well, problem may be solved here for Brock. Island was the draw step. So let's see what opens up from his hand. Remember, the splasher, even though he's listed as blue-black, Noyandar Royal Shaper. Now, that is not Noyandar. That's a dampening pulse. Brock with two of these in his deck. Creatures your opponent control get minus one, minus so. Some of you may remember this as Cumberstone or Jace Architect of Thoughts plus one. And this, is a, this is a card where I've heard varying opinions. Uh, at the minimum, everyone I've talked to feels that this card is good. There's some people who think this card's a borderline bomb and that some cards just cannot play in the face of it. It should be very good against an aggressive deck. Got a close side look out here. That is an ally. 
Oh, boy. There's a real ally theme here with Jeremy Henry's deck. Mm -hmm. That's going to find a resolute Blade Master. That's going on top now. This is a lot for Parker to overcome. Now, that Dampening Pulse is nice, giving creatures minus one, minus oh. So this will be an attack here for two first strike. Downside of the Blade Master here takes a little bit out of the sting of your first strike ally. But true. the upshot is now you have the double strike ally. Also true. And Jeremy Henry has the necessary mana to pump the squad right now. So Parker's just going to take two as Blockman Mindraker. He could just pump and then lose it. So damage will come across. Parker's going to fall down to 15. Follow up. Ah, uh, yes. The Great Horn. <laughs> One of my favorites. Two, three, first strike. You play a land, gets plus two, plus two. Oftentimes attacking is a four or five. Creature type, beast. I wouldn't want to run into one of those things. No synergies here, just a, just a thing. Plenty of synergy. Play a land. <laughs> it's good with lands. Yeah. The best kind of synergy. Ooh. Oblivion Sower now. Good in a number of respects here. Some mana for Brock, and, and more importantly, this exiles the Blade Master. Yeah, quite a bit of mana here for Brock. It looks like three, two mountains, and a plains. The processor versus scry battle that occurs in this format from time to time can be pretty funny. Yeah, kind of cool. Kind of cool. You exile the top four, top four cards for your opponent's library. Then you may put a number of land cards that player controls from exile, not just from the Oblivion Sower, by the way. Any lands that have been exiled can come to your side. Have you had the turn one sludge crawler on the play versus someone with fertile thicket on the draw? I have. It's I the have sweetest not. plum. <laughs> <laughs> A juicy, mm, 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 mm. a juicy peach, since we mm, are in Atlanta. Just, yeah. Looks like Henry's just going to pass the turn back. Brock might be turning the corner now. He's got a lot more lands to work with, even though those mountains don't do much in his deck. The planes can help because of the Noyandar, and he also does have the ally encampment to help cast Noyandar. Just doesn't appear as though he has Noyandar in his hand yet, though it looks like Brock may have a copy of Scattered of the Winds in his hand. And one thing I really like about limited, counter magic. Makes you just feel safe. Especially in a format where people are casting seven and eight mana spells pretty regularly, yeah. even the beatdown decks with Awaken or, or whatever bombs they have on their top end. So I think that Scatter the Winds in draft, again, sometimes the game can be a little bit too fast. Same critique of Grip of Desolation, but Sealed, games are going to look like this a good percentage of the time, and it's an incredible insurance policy. Swamp. Pass the turn back. As we mentioned right at the top during the pregame show, and we will be harping on this quite a bit, you're not going to see very many fast games this weekend. You're going to see long, drawn-out affairs like this. I mean, take a look at the first card that Jeremy Henry played, an 06 wall. That's how we started off the action. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of game we're looking to play. We're looking to play longer games, get to Eldrazi, Get the big cards. Get to allies that have large effects. And you can see, uh, Henry definitely has a lot of raw power in his pool. Yes. And his deck is synergistic. But there is a bit of an identity crisis here. The 06 wall does not pair all that well with a curve of allies yep. and then trying to attack. Whereas Brock's cards all feel like focus for winning the control battle. So Brock here has, has blunted Henry's early offense. The damning pulls very good to that effect and just his, his quality blockers. Whereas Henry has this weird mismatch of, of beatdown and control. Brock going to reorganize some mana here. What's the big plan here for Mr. Parker? A little awakened action on the mountain. A little divination action here? Yeah. He's looking to draw some cards with Coastal Discovery. A lot of players like this card. Seems great to me in sealed. Yeah. I, I, in, assuming the, the sealed format isn't all that fast, I'm happy to pay four mana for a draw two. And Awaken is just more juice when the game slows down. I think we can tell this format's not all that fast, can't we? Given how this game's playing out. It's rare. Henry's deck, for example, definitely can get some fast draws, but it's not going to be consistently the case. See if Henry can kind of come back from this. He's in some real trouble, it feels like, right now, though. It's a McKindy patrol. 
three mana, two, three. Keep in mind that's also an ally. Now, when this one enters the battlefield, your creatures get Vigilance. But he also gets to trigger quite a few allies that are already on the battlefield. Most importantly, it's the Munda Ambush Leader. Got that Ringleader effect. Got to put a Core Castigator on top of the deck. And given how long uh, Munda has been in play, Munda has been in play here. I think Henry really would have been well served taking some notes. He's hitting the point where he knows his draw step for the remainder of the game. Now oh, other, we're going all the way through now, now. Now, now other allies can muck this up, but he's going to be hitting the point close soon if he hasn't already to where he's on a rotation from the earlier cards he put on the top of his deck. So having some knowing that information ahead of time is very valuable. Under champion, another ally, Core Cascader still on top of the deck. I think there's that Grip of Desolation you talked about. Yep. Powerful mobile spell there from Parker. Now, one thing to note about that card, it's powerful, but it's also an instant. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this card is, is excellent. In games like this, is an incredible insurance policy. Rock also taking him off of double red there. Mm -hmm. Important because Rolling Thunder is a thing. I think that's something that you're always wary of. You know, Henry's got a million planes and only two mountains in place. So the decision's not that hard, but if you can cut your opponent off of double red, that's a, a specific reason to do so. Yeah. Transgress the mine. See what's going on over here. Stone Fury, aha! A planner outburst strategy, huh? So Jeremy Henry's got some interesting things going on in his deck. He wants to play a little offense with those allies, a little defense with the fortified rampart, a little board sweep with the planner outburst. Smite the monsters as well. Yep. There's also a Stone Fury in the hand. Transgress the Mind, another card I like in Sealed. Planner Outburst is definitely the highest card in terms of raw power here, but uh, Henry is quite a ways away from being able to play it with the Awaken cost, and Brock also has enough Awaken in his deck that he may not necessarily care about it. He's going to leave the Planner Outburst over there. Yeah, I, I think... Henry, if, he's, if he resets the board, Brock ha is up so many cards right now that he has a huge advantage. Smite the Monsters down, by the way. Yep. Parker will just pass the turn back. Planner Opera is definitely the most powerful card in Henry's hand and deck in terms of raw power, but uh, not something that's very well suited for this game. And I think one thing about this particular format is players know that um, quite a few Wrath effects like Planner Outburst do exist, mm -hmm. and they're rare, they're not a mythic. So that's actually very notable to me. And players are going to play around them accordingly. Some players might actually try to play around them too much at times, but you just know that they're there, Rolling Thunder, Planner Outburst, and a bevy of others. And this is a matchup where I really wouldn't have played around it uh, were I in Brock's position because every indication that Henry has shown this game, with the exception of the 06 wall, is that his deck's very aggressive. But having that information for games two and three is, is huge. Yeah. So Brock feels... It feels, excuse me, as though he's got a pretty firm grasp on this game. Both players kind of in a stalemate here, but Brock's the one with the more relevant spells at this point. Now here's Neldrazi. I believe that's the breaker. I believe. No, he's actually going to be doing some processing here, so excuse me. Let's make sure we know exactly what card that is. Brock actually even taking a second look. And it's actually Umal's a spoiler. So six mana, five, five, enters the battlefield. You may put two cards your opponent's own from exile to graveyard. So process two cards. There's available with four plus one plus one counter. So he's got a nine, nine. One thing to note about this particular Eldrazi, however, no trample. Nope. But it may be large enough where Parker can finally get on the offensive. Sure. Five mana here for Brock. Remember, this entire time, Parker has scattered the winds. That's why he's not too concerned about Planner Outburst. Yep. But for a number of respects, he can simply counter it, or he can have an advantage on lands on the table and actually be ahead after an awakened Planner Outburst is cast.
Parker going to put some more counters in that awakened land. Up to seven now. Beat down time. Did not get a clear look at it, but I'm assuming it was a clutch of currents. Yep. And remember, you don't have to wake up a new land. You can continue to add counters to lands that already have counters on them. Well, that appears this was the what he's done. And he bounced the Andu champion, which takes double red. Yep. Can't be recast here from Jeremy Henry at this point. It's also just the most power of any of the threats on the table. So in, in terms of Henry trying to offer up a gang block to try to get one of these large threats off the table, it, it makes it uh, the most prohibitive. Brock in a very, very good position right now. And Parker getting this land up to a 7-7 seven, seven, rather than trying to spread out a little bit because now he has two attackers that are larger than the 06 wall. So any blocks going on here from Henry are likely to be chump blocks. Looks like an encircling fissure here. Three mana, prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn by creature target opponent controls, or you can awaken it for five. The awaken there, not very impressive though, just makes a two two. Well, it, it's still, this card's still very powerful. If the board's clawed up at all and your opponent makes an alpha strike, remember this is not symmetrical, so all your Correct. stuff is still dealing damage on the way back. Yep. Also, getting a two two, no, that's not very big, but when you're playing it inside of combat, that two two gets woken up and probably gets a block and eat one of the attackers, mm -hmm. so this card's very good. It's not going to be great in this matchup because you can see Brock's plan here is to slow the game down, lock the board, and just grind Henry down. And uh, th this card, you really want to be in more of a damage race to maximize its power, but still a very good white card. Henry will play that core Castigator. That'll trigger a bunch of his allies, Munda among them. But I think, as you see him not trigger Munda, I think he knows that he's out of allies now. So we're going to head back Brock Parker's way. Brock going to start by attacking the two big creatures again. Just continuously putting Henry to the test because these creatures are so large, we're going to see double, triple blocks and removal spells can work their way into the equation to be a blowout, all sorts of stuff like that. And Damning Pulse makes things even more complicated. Oh, yeah. It's so hard for, for Henry to offer up blocks that make any inroads on the board here. Yeah, that's the big one. You see the board here for Parker. He's got the Mind Raker out there, the Culling Drone, Oblivion Sower, the two large creatures there in the 7-7 seven, seven land, and the Eldrazi attacking. But what you don't see, just a little bit under that clock there is the Damning Pulse giving all of Jeremy Henry's creatures minus one, minus oh. So now Henry has to make these really obscure blocks. Look at all the creatures that are getting in front of that Awakened Land. It might require them all. Henry's in a spot here where if Brock has anything to blow up this block, he's going to lose the game anyway. Yep. He doesn't exactly know what's going on in Parker's hand, but all of his creatures are of approximately the same value. So you might as well just put everything there let Brock kill whatever he's going to kill. It doesn't matter all that much, but try to make some inroads on the board. The problem here is that Brocker, Parker is doing this just off of a land that he's grown up for, while generating value from other spells. Uh -huh. This land represents very little investment, and Henry's going to lose some valuable assets trying to get this land off the table. You yeah, think about it, that mountain, that's not even in his deck. It's in Jeremy Henry's deck. Yep. Got that from the Olivian so Now he's using it against Jeremy Henry. It's going to take down a bunch of stuff. Sure, he'll lose that mountain, but it did some real nice work there. And all Brock is trying to do here in this situation, he's just trying to kind of clear that board out so that then cards like Mind Ricker and Culling Drone can actually start attacking. Yep. It's going to take a while to get to that point. Yes. Henry's at 20. He, he can chump block for a while or just take some shots, but um, Parker is starting to exert some leverage here. You see Oracle of Dust. For a man who grew up playing with sea snids, this has to feel like quite the luxury. <laughs> They don't make them like they used to. It's a 3-5, which is already enormous. I, that, that's about as big as a creature gets, really. And then it has a power, too. You get to put a card in your opponent owns from exile into that player's graveyard, draw a card, and discard it. You get the loot. Yeah, it's, 
This is basically. Are you this, kidding me? This is the best card I've ever seen. Are you kidding me? How are what's Henry even supposed to do here? <laughs> this is, would call for a deck check. <laughs> yeah. It's like this can't be real. The power of Oracle of Dust. Sea Snid. Ugh. Happily play the Sea Snid. Proudly. It wasn't even the twenty-third card. Might have been the thirteenth card. Right. Retreat to Amiria is here now. Now we have seen this make some waves and constructed for a player like Sam Black. It can be very, very powerful. Can the four mana enchantment? But Parker doesn't appear to mind too much. He'll let that resolve. Now we're gonna head Brock's way. He did activate that Oracle of Dust on the end step. Get the loot there. Again, remember this entire time he's he's had scattered the winds in hand, just waiting. And Retreat doesn't represent very much here for Henry's side, except that he can really prolong the game. Because every draw step, if it's a creature, that's a chump blocker. And if it's a land, that's also a chump blocker mm -hmm. if he wants it to be. It would be nice, uh, you know, as a function of time here, if Parker can either start dialing up more attackers if he feels like he's ahead enough in the game, or find a flying creature to speed up this clock a little bit. Here come the beatdowns. And again, this is kind of what it was all about for Parker. Remember, he had that large awaken land. That was a 7 7, and then Eldrazi was coming in. Big creatures to kind of eliminate the board. Now he feels comfortable enough. Oblivion Sower, you can come in. Ryan, Mind Raker, you're just a 3 3, but you can come in. That can be profitable. And his goal here the entire time is just whittle away Jeremy Henry's board. So it's something like a minor record can actually deal three points of damage, which it just did. Yep. I mean, it's, it's going to be slow because the Fortified Rampart covers the Oblivion Sower. Mm -hmm. And so Henry always gets one good block as far as that goes. But you can see Parker is starting to make some inroads. He's starting to hit for some damage here. Uh, Henry's team is starting to whittle down a little bit here. He's had to chump block a few times. It appears players really, really, really like Meyer's Malice. I think it's, uh, I, I think this card's, very important sealed. It's still fine in draft. Uh, again, uh, I, I bring this up a lot about the six mana spells and the awakened cards. Games can be too fast for this sort of thing. But in sealed, this is just another two or three for one. Take out your opponent's lands, which are valuable. Drain them of their top end of their curve, which is valuable. And it, it's rare that the game is so fast that you don't have time to cast it. One thing I like about Brock's play that turn as well. Yes, he's got necessary mana to be able to play that and for the for its awakening cost. Excuse me. But more importantly, what I like about that as it looks like Henry's going to go for the Planner Outburst now, and now we're finally going to see the Scatter of the Winds to take care of that, which Brock has known about that Planner Outburst for some time because of Transgress the Mind, so he's been setting this up for some time. But I like the use of just casting the discard spell. Just you know, A lot of people try to say, I want to get the last two cards. Well, I'm just going to cast it. Yeah, all Brock was concerned about is, do I have enough mana left over to be able to cast Scatter to the Winds with Awakened Cost? Yeah. If so, then whatever. So there was Scatter to the Winds. It was Awakened. It took care of Planner Outburst. Planner Outburst was trying to sweep the board. Parker had the answer that he's had for some time. And now he's going to activate the Oracle of Dust. He'll draw and discard a planes. But now you have to imagine if you're Parker, driver's seat here, 15, beautiful board, took care of probably the best card in your opponent's deck. And now everybody looks like it wants to get into the red zone. And I think, the, I think one of the last cards that Parker has here is Dominator Drone. So it's likely even if Henry blocks to survive combat, he will likely die to that trigger. Sure. The board's a little messy, and there's a variety of ways for Henry to chump block if he wants to. It looks like he's just giving it up, though. Brock Parker going to win game number one here over Jeremy Henry. Blue-black up a game here over red-white. Take a look at the clock. Down to 26 minutes, as we've said many times this weekend, and we will continue to say the games are going to be a little bit long here. So. One thing to know about that is that maybe players have to work their way into draw territory, maybe pick up the pace a little bit. Well, you know, Bar Parker's still up the game right now, yep. so there's no concern on his side of the table. But yes, in Grand Prix, in day one, draws are disastrous. You need a 7-2 record to make the second day, so a draw doesn't do anything for you unless you go 6-0 and 3. And that's very hard to do, mm -hmm. uh, just in an objective sense and also without getting disqualified. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on top of that, you are likely to be playing against other slow decks if you take a draw early in the tournament because you're getting paired against other 101s or what have you. 
Yeah, the thing about this format, just a complicated one. You yep. know, there's a lot going on. Gameplay is pretty dynamic. And so as a result, you're just going to see some slower games play. I mean, take a look at that game. It was pretty straightforward stuff in my opinion, but it took a while for Brock to be able to turn the corner and get the job done. It felt like Parker had a lock on the game once he played Oblivion Zower. Yeah. He had the biggest thing in play, totally locked up the ground, had enough mana to function with and a lot of expensive spells to pair with all the lands he just found. Uh, the problem was it, it still took him a very long time because Henry had a lot of blockers on the ground. Parker had nothing with evasion, and it was just a slow and steady grind. He had a sizable advantage the whole time, but going from ahead to have actually dealt lethal damage took 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes. Now, one thing to note here, you take a look there, in the bottom left-hand corner, Parker, he moved in about six or seven cards there. Mm -hmm. A little D-sleeve, unsleeve action. He's getting ready to go for the next game. And we've talked about sideboards and limited, how much different it is than constructed. Matchup dependent stuff. You maybe want specific counter spells or discard spells, things of that nature. If you think a game is going to go short, going to go long, all that stuff. And we saw Jeremy Henry take a brief look. Mm -hmm. Nothing too long, but Brock had an idea of what he wanted to do very quickly by boarding out quite a few and boarding in quite a few cards. So it'll be interesting to see what comes to the table here for game number two for Parker. Seven cards is, is interesting because that's short of swapping out a color yeah. in most instances because you have to take the lands out as well as the spells. So maybe something's happening with the splash color? Maybe. We'll see. Yeah. But seven is a lot. And I didn't see... Henry's deck was not so extremely fast or slow that you would want that sort of big swap in terms of your cards. You're not bringing in every wall you can get your hands on. You're not bringing in every Eldrazi you can get your hands on. His deck's somewhere in the middle. Looks like Jeremy Henry is going to draw this game. And again, we are in a sealed deck tournament. It's pretty slow, so it wouldn't surprise me to see a lot of players draw this particular weekend. But Henry, in this matchup, I would have gotten the Fortified Rampart out of the deck immediately. Not I, where you want to be. I don't think Henry can win a long game against Parker. It looks like Henry's edge is early on in the game. He's got a good curve of allies and a lot of powerful triggers. But later on in the game, uh, he was really outclassed by Parker with all of his Awakened Spells, Grip of Desolation. Parker's got a big edge of the game, gets to that point. Transgress the mind here from Brock. You saw him start things off with the Skyline Cascade, and then a swamp into Coral Helm Guide. Now Transgress the Mind's going to give an idea of what Henry's working with. You see Henry's hand, there's a whole bunch of mountains, five of them, a Resolute Blade Master, and then the legendary ally, Munda, Ambush Leader yet again. And now Parker's got to decide which one he wants to take. He's going to go with Munda. That'll be exiled from the discard spell. Core Helm Guide's going to come across. Now the question is, does Parker have a third land? Munda is more powerful on its own. Blade Master can be more powerful once your synergistic board is built up. Mm -hmm. But with Henry having no action, just take the most objectively powerful card. And it looks like Parker does not have a third land. So maybe choosing to draw very helpful here for Jeremy Henry. He'll play Fortified Rampart, pass the turn back. So now he's got that 2-1 checked. And looks like Parker's having some mana difficulties, but there is an island off the top of the deck. That'll be the land we had by Jeremy Henry's way. Four mana. There's the Griffin. Two, three flyer comes in, gains two life. We'll see if it resolves. This Parker did have Scatter of the Winds last game, but the Griffin will resolve. Now back-to-back -back lands here drawn for Parker. Working his way out of it. They do see Courier Griffin. That's the plan right now. It's going to get slowed down a little bit there by that dampening pulse, though. And this card's just such a great response to Resolute Blade Master. That's one of the best ways to answer Double Strike, is yep. just shrinking power. Well, there is Resolute Blade Master. And it will not be very impressive now. A very powerful card, don't get me wrong. But not all that impressive now on this board. Here come the beatdowns for a whole two. Now we're going to head back Parker's way. Four mana. Got to bring a Scion on along with it. It is Incubator Drone. Four mana, two, three. Devoid, as you can see, with the nifty artwork. And then it brings a Scion along with it. Nothing too crazy going on with that card. I think just kind of a just kind of a curve filler. If Sky Spawner is the superstar, this is the end of the bench. Okay. As far as the okay. the you know the Devoid Eldrazi enablers go for blue and in, in in at common, I'm sure Brock are still thrilled to uh, to play it here, as he needs some more mana. It blocks 
the the two two now one two on the ground pretty effectively. Yep. And that scion can be very useful in yeah. this particular format. Especially with Henry just really light on action right now. Mm -hmm. We know his hand. A lot of mountains over there. Now it's just three clans. Yeah. And this fortified rampart is really causing Henry some trouble here. Parker was missing his land drops early on in the game. If Henry just finds reasonable power and toughness attacking creatures that can uh, just get in the red zone, he might be able to capitalize on Parker's stumble. But the spell that he drew when he was flooding out a little bit is this 06 wall that just slows the game down. And now Parker has uh, a lot of opportunity here to find the lands and draw out of this. Yeah, it looks like we do have a judge intervening in some things very quickly with a ruling. So we come back to us here very quickly. Cedric Phillips, Patrick Sullivan here from the booth. And, and we'll find out exactly what the ruling will be when we do have confirmation for you guys, as you saw him having a conversation with the judge in the feature match area. But in the meantime, as we do get ready here to join game number two back in progress, you saw game number one, just a really long, grindy, run out affair. And I think, again, that's going to be what we see a lot today. We'll mm -hmm. see what happens tomorrow. Maybe players are able to draft aggressive ally decks or aggressive strategies. But on day number one, I would be very surprised to see something like that come together. Maybe when we get really deep in the tournament, 7 0s, 8 0s, stuff like that. So, so you have to be, you know, I, I don't understand. Uh, if there's other cards here in this list, didn't look it over that thoroughly to see if there was other cards Henry could have gone to. But uh, again, that identity crisis is coming up a little bit in this matchup. Yep. There's going to be a lot of games where, where you play where your deck's, your opponent's deck is also in the middle. You know, a little bit of offense, a little bit of defense. And the 06 wall may or may not be good, depending sure. on what the texture of the specific game looks like. But in this matchup, where Brock has a decided advantage later on in the game, but doesn't have a whole lot early on in the game to defend himself. We saw him in both games, he's had fairly slow starts, and he hasn't defended himself that well in the first four or five turns of the game. It's so important for Henry to be on the offensive early on. And, um, uh, you know, that's where, again, the sideboarding comes into such a critical thing, because I think Henry needed to take out some of these more late-game cards. Even if he has to play, play cards that are lower power level just to leverage his early advantage, because once the game slows down, Parker, I think, has an inevitable advantage. Hey, you got to figure out which role you are, right? The matchup, yeah. are you the control deck, or are you the aggressive deck? Uh, it's much more pronounced and constructed magic, but for limited magic, you know, we saw how game number one played out, and I think if we have a long, drawn-out game like that quite a bit, I think that goes to Parker. And, and for example, in Henry's sideboard here, he's got two copies of Lava Step Raider and a McKinney Slide Runner. I think Fortified Rampart's a more powerful card than either of those cards are in Sealed. But in this particular matchup, I would have given it a once-over and tried to see if there's a way to take out the most defensive cards in the deck just to get a little bit more early offense. I would have also probably taken the play and just tried to focus the deck that way. Sure, fair enough. Yeah. Well, we're going to find out exactly what does happen. Now, we have a very interesting ruling taking place right now. Uh, uh, apparently, one of Jeremy's cards, Jeremy being the opponent of Brock Parker, got shuffled into... Brock's lap. This is very new. Is Never this Oblivion new. Sower related, or is this something else happened? That could be Oblivion Sower related from the previous game. I, I don't know. Lands. Sure. So, um, a head judge is getting involved. We're going to find out exactly what's going on. I'm not sure if we're able to move over to another match or not. Uh, a strange situation taking place in the future match area in round number two. So, as we, and we do have an update for you guys in the ruling, all that stuff. Perhaps we'll be able to bring our head judge over here and let you guys know exactly what did take place there. So, they'll get it sorted out. Hopefully, no penalties are issued there. Seems like a pretty honest mistake, but, you know, We'll, we'll find out what does happen as the head judge is already in the area getting that taken care of. But, you know, that aggressive slant, I agree with you. I would have liked to see Jeremy Henry maybe take that approach for game number two mm -hmm. because you can see exactly what Fortified Rampart is doing this particular game and what it did last game. Didn't really have much of an impact on the last game. In this game, he would have liked for that to be an aggressive threat given the mana stumbles that Brock did mm -hmm. have. But it just doesn't really line up very well against blue-black, in my opinion. No, and Henry's having some trouble in this game because he's flooding out. Yes. So there... Only one card here, this being a, a slide runner versus a no six wall, probably only going to make so much difference at the end of the day. He sure. does need to start drawing some high impact spells soon. Um, but it is important in these matchups to go to your sideboard and take a look and see if you can alter your deck. We saw Kenji do that in the first round. I don't exactly sure how he sideboarded, but he at least gave it a once over. Mm -hmm. This round, again, Brocker, Brock Parker sideboarded several cards. Yep. 
some of them might have ended up in a lap or something. We'll find. <laughs> but he at least made the effort to sideboard, yes. you know. And uh, his opponent here, and Henry, made no effort. And now it feels like the mismatched elements of his deck are coming back to haunt him here when he's playing against a close to a pure control deck, yeah. which is what Brock Parker has. Yeah, this really deck that Parker does have looks pretty good. Again, the cards in his deck complete disregard a great removal spell. Culling Drone, a good curve filler, turns on ingest as well, devoid to Dominator Drone. Nice card to have Grip, grip of Desolation, which was very good that last game. You know, yep. one of the first times I've really seen that cast and have it have a really huge effect. Again, a lot of the community feeling that's one of the best uncommons, and you feel it's the best uncommon. In, in the sealed, it, it, I think in draft it, it starts becoming a different equation, but in sealed, it's the one that I would want most of all. Uh, Clisher Night Watch is the four or five flyer uh, with Life Link uh, that can turn on. Excuse me, when ga when life is gained, it'll be going to the skies there. Mind Raker, uh, uh, Myers Malice is a card that we've seen already through the first two rounds of matches. That discard spell, you like that one li a lot in sealed. I do. I, I think that everyone's got something going on in their top end, and even the deck that don't have a lot in terms of Eldrazi are still using Landfall and Awaken cards. Sure. Every every card's valuable in this format. You saw Parker there at the end of the first game. He had a, a million lands in play, and he was still able to tap out on turns where he wanted to tap mm -hmm. out. He never lacked for action. In formats like that, discard spells are going to be very powerful, and especially in slow ones, because every card is important in your opponent's hands. Either a spell, and as the game progresses, it's more and more likely to be the last removal spell, or the big Eldrazi to finish off the game. And even tagging two lands out of someone's hand later on in the game, way more valuable here than it is in most formats. Transgress the Mind, another card that Parker has in his main deck, and a card I'm a really, really big fan of. Uh, basically for the same reasons that you mentioned with, with Myers Malice, but just discard seems to be pretty good in this format, and being able to discard cards that are three or more and actually exile them, which is important for processing, that's a pretty big deal. Being able to just pinpoint that card. We saw in game number two where he took a Smite the Monstrous, saw that his opponent had a Planner Opera Sand, was able to play around that accordingly. We saw that kind of unfold at later stage of the game, scatter the winds, got awakened to take care of the Planner Opera, and just that information and we're working in a form where the spells are very big. Trying to aggress the mind seems very good. Uh, it, it, to me, it's a card that has a lot, it fluctuates a lot between sealed and draft. Yeah. Uh, I've been talking about a lot about how the speed of draft m makes it different from sealed. You do play against aggressive decks in draft in a way that you don't really do in sealed. And those discard spells swing a lot in value. Transgress the mind using your second turn on that, rather than playing somebody to the board against someone who's trying to curve out against you, can be problematic. You also feel it when you draw it on turn 10 and everyone's hand has been played out. In sealed, both of those scenarios are a lot less likely to be the case. It opens up the window for discard to be viable longer in the game, and you are going to be tagging your opponent's bomb a, a good percentage of the time as well. So uh, I think Transgress the mind in draft you can play it, you can cut it, you can side it in a lot, whatever. I think if you're black and sealed, you just want to have that card in your deck. Blue cards in Parker's deck, Clutch of Currents, obviously a very good one. Coastal Discovery as well. Two copies of Dampening Pulse. Been impressed with that so far. Again, that Comfort Stone, the plus on Jace Architect of Thought, just minus one, minus so. You don't think of it very much as an effect. You know, you're not really going towards that effect for Constructed Magic, but when you think about maybe Mono Blue Devotion and how it used Jace Architect of Thought and how Esper Control during that time used Jace Architect of Thought, minus one, minus so, in those decks that had an impact on attacking, and that's much more pronounced than limited. Yeah, and I, I really like the two copies of Dampening Pulse in this deck. Yeah. It's not a card that you're cutting uh, from your decks, but Brock's deck does feel built around it. He yeah. is trying to slow the game down. Uh, for him, that card's probably going to save him quite a bit more damage than even something like a 3-3 three, three for 4 is going to. And once he slows the game down because of cards like Grip of Desolation, Oblivion Sower, even some other cards that you may not necessarily think of being late-game bombs, but I would put Coastal Discovery on that list as well. When the game drags out, that's worth a whole lot of cards. Yep. It f further locks down the board, and uh, Parker's dampening pulses help him get to that stage of the game. Uh, more blue cards here. Incubator Drone, we saw that one. The back of the bench, as far as Eldrazi Scion creators are concerned. Mist Intruder, seems like every blue deck has that because you've got Ingest, it's just a one-two flyer. But it does serve its role. Oracle of Dust, the card drawer, Scatter the Winds. So it, it's pretty nice. It's a pretty nice one here. So we do have an update for you guys on our head shows ruling. It looks like it's looking at extra cards for Brock. I believe that brings a warning along with it. Yeah, but it's not, so, a, it's not a game loss penalty. Yep. Yeah. So I believe after it does get all cleaned up and all of that stuff, we'll be heading back down to the match here in just a moment. So looking at extra, looking at extra cards, excuse me, is the head judge's ruling in that situation. And I believe more action going to be on the way. So yeah. a, a weird, funky situation, but the head judge has turned, I believe, Toby Elliott with your ruling there. And you can see when we were down in the pit there, before we came back to the booth, there was a little bit of panic on Brock's face because sometimes those, the, those discrepancies, depending on what the judge interprets or what the exact ruling can be, that could be a game loss or even potentially worse, given yeah. on the, the, the particulars. But but looks like nothing too serious happened there. Just a warning for looking at extra cards. Um, as long as it doesn't happen for the rest of the tournament on Brock's side, it's, it's basically just in the past. Sure. Well, back down to the feature match here. We are going to go. 
and we will watch this game continue here. And we'll update you on the board, especially if you are just joining us. Hedger Phil is Patrick Sullivan here at Grand Prix Atlanta on Brock Parker's side. He's got some lands on the battlefield. You see an Oblivion Sower. He's also got the Coral Helm Guide, two copies of Dampening Pulse, and that Incubator Drone. On Jeremy Henry's side, he's coming in with the Coral Helm, excuse me, with the Griffin, not the Coral Helm Griffin. It's a, it's a Courier Griffin. Fortified Rampart, bunch of lands on a Resolute Blade Master, but the biggest problem here for Henry is that Dampening Pulse just making his creature so small. Yep, and now the Coral Helm Guide is gonna be, uh, allow Parker to use his mana to punch the Oblivion Soar through the Fortified Rampart if he's feeling so inclined. For Parker, it's another copy of Dampening Pulse. This is not a lot of fun to play against. I don't want to call this a lock necessarily, but we're pretty close. Uh, Henry is going to struggle to play through this. He does not have a lot of three power in his deck. No. Fortify Rampart's going to be able to jump in front of Oblivion Sower, but we're going to head back Jeremy Henry's way. Now, Planner Outburst was the draw. That could be very useful. Don't know if Parker has Scatter the Winds in hand. It always, it, it, it's always nice to be able to draw that Wrath Effect. Yes. Maybe reset some things. That said, one card that's not going to go away with the Wrath Effect are those damping pulses. Those stay. Here's Planner Outburst. And you can see some, he some hesitation there from Henry, and, and Brock's just going to counter this. But yep. the, the board was no longer manageable from Henry. I don't know if Planner Outburst is a winning play in this spot, but the board's a lost cause the way that it currently looks. Yeah. So he's just got to try. Kind of a cross your fingers esque approach there. Yeah, I mean, maybe Parker's all on land somehow, even though he was missing land drops early on in the game. <laughs> you at least have something large enough in your awakened land to have power, to, to have some functionality in the game. And the rest of this board is worth very little. And a lot of the time with effects like Dampening Pulse, you think, oh, okay, my creatures just get minus one, minus one on attacks. Oh, no. This is on blocks, too. Now Parker is going to do some ingesting. We belong to spoilers here with four counters. Remember that the Coral Helm Guide's still in play on Parker's side, mm -hmm. too. So when he wants to speed it up a little bit, he can start punching through for a lot of damage. Coral Helm Guide is a card I've enjoyed a lot in this limited format. Pretty good early, even though it's not really an early game format, and a delight late. This can be, you know, for... It's not the perfect card in Parker's deck, although because he doesn't have a lot of flyer, but he has a lot of huge Eldrazi's, it's good when the board comes down. But this is the kind of card that allows beatdown decks to still have a late game. Yeah. You, you get to do something productive with your mana, and it's especially a, a important in a format like this where the, where the ground can get locked up. Coral Helm Guide says... Well, Mox, a spoiler, you are unblockable. Let's get this game over with. A healthy attack for nine. Parker will play a swamp. He'll pass the turn back. Henry's down to three. He's on his last legs here. He'll get a draw step. Don't know if he's got anything to get himself out of this situation, though. I mean, with what more land, Parker is now getting two activations a turn here. Mm -hmm. Can punch through the sower, the sower along with it a spoiler. Oh, well. A serpentine spike. Okay. So he's going to split up some damage here. And Parker is going to have some cards exiled. The spike deals two, three, and then four. And anything that's killed via the spike is exiled, which, of course, is nice in this particular format with processors. And it's a temporary reprieve here. Yes. I remember that, uh, that the spoiler is still a 9 9. It still needs to be blocked because it's a lethal attack. So Resolute Blade Master is going to jump in front. Yeah, Henry is in the Abyss, but as a consolation, his creatures aren't worth anything. So it's not really a huge cost. <laughs> the Skimmer, it's oh so <laughs> silent. <laughs> Along with the Oracle of Dust. I, I hope that you mix up your silent Skimmer sound effects all weekend long. <sighs> there you go. That's nice. That's nice. There's some skimming to be done here. Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Coming for you. <laughs> Jeremy has a Hedron Archive. That is going to resolve. He'll get to draw two. We call him Big Skims on the street. Hedron Archive, very good card in this format. Very good in slow games. Yeah. 
give you a little acceleration, give you some cards. Another swing card and draft, it's much more deck specific. It's not nearly the high pick, but in seal, this is an important card to open. Spike the Monstrous is nice. The problem is big skim just doesn't even need to connect. Yep. Let's see what Brock has now. He's going to tap some mana. He's going to activate the Oracle. It took care of Void Winnerer. That's placed in the graveyard. Now draw discard here for Parker. Bunch of mana here for Brock. Maybe he's trying to go for a W here. He's got a grip of desolation. Get the fortified rampart out of here. And a planes. Yeah, this puts Henry on having to double chump block this turn. Yep. Fortified Rampart has been annoying long enough. It's X out along with the planes. Everything has to attack. You mentioned the double chump block that does have to take place. Big skims will trigger. Henry down to one. And there are your two chump blocks. And one thing that Parker knows is the Planner Outburst is gone. So unless you have a second one, that Stone Fury is the draw. If I, was in, if I was in Parker's spot, I probably would not have cast Grip of Desolation. He has the kill next turn the same way anyway. And you don't know, there could be a second copy of Planner Outburst in this person's seal pool. It's not impossible. Yeah. I can, I can appreciate trying to get the game over with, but I probably would have just not cast it, attacked with everything, let him put the 06 in front of the Oblivion Sower and kill next turn. Maybe a little more conservative. Because Big Skim's just... He doesn't even need... He doesn't even need to connect. That no. just happens when he enters <laughs> combat. That's just free. That's on the house. And if Big Skims does connect, it doesn't deal any damage. Right. Looks like players might have a little bit of life total discrepancy here on if there was a trigger from the skimmer. Uh, Parker pointed at it. Yeah, it seemed, it seemed pretty Look, clear. Looked like he got it. Yep. Seemed like pretty clear non-verbal communication, but there is a judge in the area. It's hard to, it's hard to hear the trigger because yep. it's silent. Yep. But it, it did happen. I saw yeah. Parker point at it. That is all part of the skimmer. An SCG live favorite here. Oh, yeah. A cult classic. <laughs> so Henry's going to need a lot to get out of this sticky situation. Again, he does have Stone Fury in hand. Not quite sure the rest of the contents. Looks like there might be an Andu Great Heart over there. Henry just trying to see if there's some way for him to double chump block. Yep. Again. Kill big skims. Yeah. There's the Great Heart. Pass the turn back over to Parker. Does not look good. I have a feeling Brock might have some interest in moving to his attack step. And he says, ah, no skimming just yet. Got a Stone Fury that. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. That resolves. I will still attack you. Yeah. I'll kill you yep. by other creatures, yeah. He just didn't want to go down to big skims, which is completely understandable. Right. Brock Parker going to win this match over Jeremy Henry. Two games to zero. Blue Black takes care of Red White. And for Parker, from a Pro Tour champion, Grand Prix champion as well, he's 2-0 here. Only one by though. Still challenging even early on in the tournaments. I, I know that a lot of people have the perception that Grand Prix really heat up at round four. You get all the Platinum Pros coming off their buys and so forth. But uh, these tournaments are always scattered with successful players from Magic's past, and uh, Brock Parker definitely among them.